Welcome again to online worship from here at Dunkeld. Next Sunday we're going to try having services proper here in the cathedral, but we're going to continue an online presence for the time being because we're well aware that many people won't yet feel confident about coming out into larger groups. And anyway, with the restrictions there are, we can't accommodate the whole congregation as it is. Over the last wee while here, we've enjoyed some beautiful days, lovely sunny days. But it's very obvious now that autumn is coming. There's a nip in the air. The light is changing. The trees are beginning to turn. And around here, that means glorious autumn colours for a few weeks, because there are so many trees around this part of the world. Maybe in part, we've got to thank the fourth Duke of Athol for that, who was a pioneer of forestry, but more of him later when we talk about trees. Let's start with some verses from Psalm 104, which glories in creation. Bless the Lord my soul, Lord my God, you are very great, clothed in majesty and splendor, and enfolded in a robe of light. From your dwelling you water the hills, the earth is enriched by your provision. You make grass grow for the cattle, and plants for the use of mortals, producing grain from the earth, food to sustain their strength wine to gladden the hearts of the people, and oil to make their faces shine. The trees of the Lord flourish, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted, birds build their nests in them, the stork makes her home in their tops. High hills are the haunt of the mountain goat, and the crags a cover for the rock badger. As long as I live, I shall sing to the Lord. I shall sing psalms to my God all my life long. May my meditation be acceptable to him. Bless the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. So let's do that in the words of hymn 149, Let All Creation Dance. believe that God made the heavens and the earth, water, sky and land, plants, trees and seeds. God made them and loved them and saw that they were good. We believe God created light and dark, sun, moon and stars, bright day and restful night. God made them and loved them and saw that they were good. We believe God made all creatures birds, fish and animals, human beings in his own image. God made them and loved them and saw that they were good. Praise God the Maker, praise God the Son, praise the Holy Spirit, God the Three in One. 
Let us pray. Creator God, in whose image we are made, in whose sight everyone and everything are precious, we are the most blessed of people. For the life around us we give you thanks and praise. Redeeming God, by your grace in Christ, we are renewed, forgiven, set free. We are the most blessed of people. For the life within us, we give you thanks and praise. We have repaid your goodness with rebellion. So for the ways we have hurt one another and failed you, we are truly sorry. We seek your forgiveness and we pledge ourselves to start again in your strength. Holy Spirit, sustainer, helper, by you we are led forward out of what we were into what we can be in God's strength energized and inspired, embraced in peace. We are the most blessed of people. For the life ahead of us, we give you thanks and praise. These prayers we offer in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Perthshire has been branded as Big Tree Country and around the Dunkeld area are some significant trees. The Burnham Oak is reputed to be the last survivor of the oak forest that once covered that part of the river bank, immortalised by Shakespeare in Macbeth, till Burnham Wood shall march to Dunsinane. This tree doesn't go quite as far back as Macbeth's time, I gather, but she is a very old lady and needs a wee bit of help to hold her up nowadays. Up at the Hermitage was the tallest tree in the UK. That was until a gale hit it a few years ago, and I suppose instantly it became the longest tree in the UK. There's Neil Gow's tree on the Inverside, where supposedly he sat and played his fiddle at the side of the river, and there's a lovely bench under it now where we can sit and hum his tunes and imagine him playing them at that spot. And there's a, f a host of fine specimens around the place. But just beyond the fence of the cathedral here at the west end is a tree called the parent larch. It's the last of five seedlings that were planted here around the 1740s, they think. The second Duke of Athol got larch seedlings from the Tyrrell and the seeds were taken from those trees to create forests on the hillside around here. They reckon over 14 million trees were planted. Surely an, an example of nature's abundance and fruitfulness from those five trees. So that's my starting point today for my thoughts. The parent larch was planted at the time of the second duke, but it was this man, John the fourth duke, who earned the name the planting duke. And he was also the one behind the building of Dunkeld Bridge. His statue stands proudly in the chapter house of the cathedral here, which in his day the Athels owned. He was a pioneer in forestry, planting larch on a commercial scale in a way not done before. There is a myth, and I promised a local historian I would emphasise it is a myth, that a cannonball full of seeds was fired onto the hill north of here to scatter seeds on inaccessible terrain to spread trees all over it. We know it's a myth because the Duke left detailed accounts of the techniques for forestry, that saplings should be one or two feet tall, how far apart they should be planted and so on. But it's always a shame when you find that these old stories are actually not true. Now he was doing this for commercial reasons, hoping to get the wood from those trees down to Woolwich in London and hoping it would replace oak as the main wood used in shipbuilding. Unfortunately for him, or for his successors, 
by the time the trees matured, shipbuilding had moved on and they no longer used timber to build these great hulls. But the timber was used for pit props and eventually for a sad use to build trenches in the First World War. But isn't it interesting that although it was a commercial venture, it led to the extensive planting of trees, something which we now would know is good for the environment. Wouldn't it be great if our commercial ventures were equally environmentally friendly? So this larch represents some very modern issues. The very thing we are told is needed now to help the planet and climate change was done then. In thinking of its significance, let's hear part of the creation narrative in Genesis 1, 25 to 31. God made wild animals, cattle and every creeping thing, all according to their various kinds, and he saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image after our likeness, to have dominion over the fish in the sea, the birds of the air and the cattle, all wild animals on land and everything that creeps on the earth. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish in the sea, the birds of the air and every living thing that moves on the earth. God also said, throughout the earth, I give you all plants that bear seed and every tree that bears fruit with seed, they shall be yours for food. All green plants I give for food to the wild animals, to the birds of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, every living creature. So it was, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Evening came, morning came, the sixth day. From the very start, human beings have had to live in harmony with our environment. And we have always sought to develop and change it. We use resources, we shape the place we live. When this area around here is different from what it would have been in the days when the Burnham Oak was but an acorn. We've always sought to improve our living. There's an old story about uh, a man who was working away in his garden and the minister cycled past and said, ah, Jock, you, you and the Lord are making a grand job of this garden. To which Jock replied, well, you should have seen it when the Lord had it to himself. We are commissioned to work the land from Genesis onwards. The trouble arises when our activity becomes destructive, when our commercial interests, unlike the days of the Duke, do harm rather than benefit. The very issues we are grappling with just now. Now, I'm not a scientist. I don't understand the science all behind it. But we hear people like David Attenborough and people we trust saying things are becoming critical near the point of no return. There was a report in the paper this week about a study done by the World Wildlife Fund highlighting the animals which are threatened with extinction now. And of course, the world of the Bible was very different from our own. Fewer people, less consumption, no industrialization and so on. And the Old Testament had rules about the use of the land. The purpose of those rules was declared in Deuteronomy so that you might prosper on the land that the Lord has given you. How to care for it, how to share its produce. So the rules might change and the, the circumstances change, but the principles are intact. And a lot of trouble historically has come down to our interpretation of Genesis 1.26, to have dominion over the earth. And with that ringing in our ears, Europeans, mainly Europeans, have traveled the globe, exploiting its resources as if there were no tomorrow, because we have dominion, don't we? But the first part of the verse says, let us make human beings in our image, 
after our likeness, and they will have dominion. In other words, any dominion we have is to be exercised in God's image, as if it were God himself. Any nation who appoints an ambassador expects that person to speak on behalf of the government and to reflect what the government thinks. If he or she doesn't, if they go off message, they will very soon be recalled. And that's our position in the pecking order of creation. We have dominion to be in God's likeness. And what does Genesis suggest as God's likeness here? God declares it good what he has made. He, he delights in it. He enjoys it. He gives it to provide for our needs, not our greed. And he cares for it. The turning seasons reflect a constant renewal of the earth. While earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. So use it by all means, adapt it, but be careful how you do that. Viruses, I have to say, are very difficult to understand why we have them at all and what they're about, and there's a real mystery there. But COVID maybe has demonstrated that so much of what we do is damaging the air and the water. It's cleaner now. And I know for me personally, I don't need to drive nearly as much as I did. We can do meetings virtually. We can do so many things without unnecessary travel. That's just one very small example. And maybe COVID too has forced us to pause and take time to enjoy the creation around us instead of rushing around and missing it all the time. In our greed and in our understandable desire for a better lifestyle, we have done a lot of damage to the earth and to ourselves. The planting juke, perhaps more by accident than design, gave us a beautiful managed landscape and thousands of trees to enhance our environment, which even yet are doing good work for the air we breathe. he had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees came together in a body, and one of them tried to catch him out with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the first commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. 
everything in the law and the prophets hangs on these two commandments. Always treat others as you would like them to treat you. That is the law and the prophets. In that hymn we had before the reading, there's a line that says, Christ, reconnect us. And there are different ways we could explore that, I suppose. For one thing, there is a need to reconnect with the earth. I think we all understand that one of the things modern living has done to us is distance us from the land. Food comes prepackaged from a supermarket, so we don't need to get our hands dirty. And by and large, I suppose we are quite happy with that. But that's why I love the garden and why allotments are good and things like the field and the orchard and the school garden, which are features of life in Dunkeld and Burnham are so good. They reinforce that connection with the soil that we've lost in so many ways. So this idea of having dominion is not us over and above the land, but us being put in a position of stewardship and caring for it. A few weeks ago, in one of these services, I was talking about the, the origins of this place and mentioned that in Western Christian thinking, there was often an element of a very negative view of the physical and material in life, as opposed to the spiritual. The spiritual was deemed superior. In fact, it might even be seen that the material would seduce you into wrongdoing and sin. And it's but a short step from that attitude to exploiting the earth for our own ends because it's not spiritual, and we are in the business of soul-saving, so we can safely disregard the material. The Celtic founders of this place, however, didn't have that dichotomy between the material and the spiritual. They were from the same hand of the same God. I've mentioned often about Celtic crosses, the circle representing the universe, the created order the cross of Christ. The two are the same God. And so in Celtic thinking, there was a valuing, a caring for the earth, which was of God's making and which he declared good. Now go back to Genesis and it says there in the creation narratives that God took earth and made a man. And in chapter three, after the fall, it says, dust you are and to dust you shall return. Now there's a fundamental truth there that we are clay vessels. Everything we are as physical beings comes from the earth. So we are made of the earth. And if we poison the earth and the waters, we poison ourselves. It comes back to us eventually. If we destroy a species, we destroy an intrinsic part of life. We know that if bees were to disappear, we would follow pretty soon after it because there'd be no means of pollinating plants. It's never been put better than Chief Seattle's words in Washington in 1854 in a speech he made to the president. Tell your children what we have taught our children, that the earth is our mother. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. If men spit upon the ground, they spit upon themselves. So we need to reconnect with the earth. But there's a need to reconnect to each other through Christ as well. And Christ does this. The environment and the use of resources becomes an, an issue of justice for our neighbors, loving our neighbors. It's a well-rehearsed fact that if all of the Earth's population were to consume as much as we do in the West, we would need several planets like the Earth to provide enough. And people look at our lifestyle and think, I'd like some of that, and fair enough, who can blame them? But they are overlooked, sometimes shoved aside to make way for more exploitation. These are huge issues. And there are no easy answers. It touches on issues about waste and pollution, greed, exploitation, fair trade, consumption, 
empowering people all matters of the Spirit, of the kind of Spirit we are. Perhaps we are inclined to think our focus as Christian people should be the spiritual. It's not for us to worry about the environment and the way we use the earth, that, but that's to ignore the one who made it and who makes us in his likeness with responsibility to steward his gifts. It is to ignore the Christ who died for his world, who commanded us to love God and to love our neighbours as we love ourselves. It's all interlinked, because when we damage one, we damage all. Love God and love your neighbour as you love yourself. Trees have been used in the Bible to signify different things. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. At the very end, in the book of Revelation, there's the tree of life in the garden there. And in between, there are passages like Psalm 1, which describes the person who abides in the law of God as being like a tree planted beside a river, beside water channels. It's fresh, it's vibrant, it's growing. When we live in his ways of love for God, for neighbour, we find that full life that God intends. There's still so much we get wrong, still so much about life that perplexes us, but we know we are in the hands of a loving Creator who loved us enough to send His Son, who died for us, for His world, that we might have life. For the things we've done and left undone For the ways we've wandered from your heart Forgive us, we pray Forgive us, we pray For the idols we on your throne for the loves we choose above your own forgive us we pray forgive us we
Let us pray. We can go around with our eyes shut and fail to see the wonder of the world around. Or we can open our eyes and see and rejoice in all you have given us. So we thank you. We can go around with our eyes shut and fail to see the mess we have made of things as a race the damage done to your creation and to each other, the green places made into desert. Lord, have mercy on us and grant us the grace to change. We can shut our eyes to the suffering and injustice in the world and pretend it has nothing to do with us. Or we can open our eyes to poverty human rights abuses, the fear many live with daily. For the ones left out and left behind, we pray. Lord, have mercy and open our hearts in compassion to pray and work for your kingdom. But it's hard to shut our eyes to the suffering around us. We know of illness and loss, hurt, unresolved problems and issues. We know the burdens we ourselves carry. Lord, have mercy on us too. Bring your day when the desert will sing and rejoice, when the wounded are healed, and the barren places renewed. Hear our prayers as we pray in Jesus' name and in his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of the earth be with you. The peace of the heavens too. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you all now 
and forevermore. Amen.